session tonight. We'll have uh, more tomorrow afternoon as we wrap up the seminar. Uh, just briefly, I'll mention I do have some resources on the table back there. I have the entire seminar, Clouds Without Water, on a DVD set. That's available. Then I've got little flash drives, little USB flash drives, wooden flash drives with a magnetic cap. And those have a, a lot of my teaching preloaded onto them. And those are available. And then uh, two books I've written, one on children and conversion, the title Do Not Hinder Them, A Biblical Examination of Childhood Conversion, How to Tell When Conversion Has Truly Taken Place in Your Child's Life. Uh, just because a child makes intellectual assent to the basic facts of the gospel does not mean that that child is ready to be baptized. We are baptizing millions of unconverted children just because they make you know, uh, intellectual assent and a verbal profession of faith. It doesn't mean that they have been converted. And, uh, and then a little book on Santa Claus entitled Santa Paws. And uh, just some things to think through before you decide to do uh, Jolly Old St. Nick with your kids. All right. Okay, so tonight's session is entitled Hearing from Heaven, How to Know the Voice of God. Almost every evangelical today seems to believe that God is speaking to them. You know, God told me to tell you that you need to do such and such. Uh, Pastor, God spoke to me and he told me to tell you that our church needs to go this direction. God told me this. God told me that. Have you ever heard people say that and it's made you wonder, what's wrong with me? You know, I just don't hear God talk to me like that. You know, is there something wrong with my walk with the Lord? Do, do these people have a closer relationship with Jesus than do I? Is there something wrong with me? Uh, am I not even saved? Because I just, I don't, I don't hear God talk to me like that. You know, and, and if God is talking to it, how do you, how do you know when it's God? What, what does God sound like? You know, all those questions. So, so if those questions um, you have wrestled with, uh, and maybe are wrestling with now, I hope that this next hour or so will be an encouragement to you. So as we begin, let's define a couple of terms here first, because these are terms that are widely misunderstood and misused. One is revelation. Revelation refers to God revealing new information that up until that point has been previously hidden. So God revealing something new. Dear friends, revelation is not happening anymore today. God is not revealing anything new that He has not already revealed to us in His Word. Now, what is happening today is illumination. This refers to the enabling work of God's Holy Spirit in the lives of us as believers to help us to understand and to appropriate, to obey the truths of Scripture. Illumination. So, um... Most of us as believers, if not all of us, we can think about different points in our lives that uh, maybe we are reading a verse of Scripture, maybe we've read it a thousand times before, we've heard it preached before and just never really understood it, but all of a sudden, oh, the light comes on. It's like, oh, okay, that's what that means. Now I get it. So that is illumination, and that should be happening in our lives as believers today helping us to understand what is already written in Scripture. So illumination, yes. Revelation, no. So when you hear someone say, oh, oh well, God really gave me a revelation on this or that, or no, He didn't. Uh, illumination, maybe, if you're talking about helping you to understand Scripture, but not revelation. All right. But everybody today seems to believe and teach others that God is speaking to them. Beth Moore is a good example of this. Beth Moore writes in, his, in her book, Praying God's Words, she says this, What little I know, I want others to know. Before God tells me a secret, He knows up front I'm going to tell it. By and large, that's our deal. So you see, Beth Moore and the Alpha and Omega have their own special little deal going on between the two of them. And uh, do you have your own special little deal just between you and, and God? Well, if you don't, then you're just not as spiritual as Beth Moore, you see. And this doesn't even make any sense. Before God tells me a secret, He knows up front I'm going to tell it. So if He knows you're going to tell it, how is it a secret? 
And it doesn't even make any sense. Then she writes in another one of her books this. She said, I heard the voice of God speak to my heart, come and play. I love that he said, come, not go, come. That meant he was already there. I also love how I could tell by the sweet tone of his silent voice. I don't even know what that means. That he was smiling. A sweet tone. What is a sweet tone of a silent voice? If his, what is a silent voice? And, it, and if his voice is silent, how do you know it has a tone to it? Much less that it's a sweet tone. That is a convoluted mess. <laughs> but I could tell by the sweet tone of his silent voice that he was smiling. I could have outlined his expression with my finger. Ooh. <laughs> now, friends, that's just gross. I mean, that's just gross. One of the things that you'll notice about a lot of these popular female Bible teachers is that they speak of Jesus like he is their boyfriend. They have a very romanticized view of Jesus. Beth Moore does it. Joyce Meyer does it. Priscilla Shire does it. All of them do it. Very romanticized view of Jesus. Then she continues. She says, I built a snowman. I laughed with God. He laughed with me. I am so in love with him. I am so in love with him. You see? You see the romanticized view that she has of Jesus? He is her boyfriend. And it's just gross. Now, lest you think I'm using hyperbole here, uh, this is a tweet that she put up August of last year. She said this. She said, I'm growing grapes for reals. It's like a miracle. If Jesus try, is tr trying to get me to crush on him, it's working. What are you talking about? If Jesus is trying to get me to crush on him, she's literally writing like she's, like she's a freshman in high school with a crush on some boy. Like, you're talking about Christ. It's just gross. It's just gross. But lots of people claim that God speaks to them and tell us that we should be hearing God speak to us. Uh, this belief and this teaching is almost unchallenged in the evangelical world. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, watch this from Rick Warren. Last week, we began a new uh, mini-series on understanding how to hear the voice of God. Very few things are more important than this because you can't have a relationship to God if you can't hear God. If all you do is ever talk to Him in prayer and you never hear God speak to you, that's a one-way relationship. That isn't much of a relationship. If all you ever do is talk to God and you never hear Him talk to you, that's a one-way relationship. That's not much of a relationship. So the stakes are high, right? So in other words, if you're not hearing God speak to you on a regular basis outside of Scripture, then you don't have much of a relationship with God. And I, I can't help but to notice some of you, maybe most of you have heard the you know, the news, Rick Warren made big news here in the last couple of weeks when he came out and he said uh, he made a big apology to women. And he said, I am sorry that I have taught for 50 years that, um, that, it's, that women should not be pastors. And he made a big mea culpa for this and apologized. And he said, it's just been in the last three years, maybe, maybe it was 40 years, but he said, it's just been in the last three years that I've come to realize that I was wrong in my understanding of Scripture. I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. Okay, A, you've been a pastor for decades, and you're just now figuring out who is eligible to be a pastor, and that's what you've been for the last 40 years? But B, if God is speaking to you on a regular basis, like he just claimed, and, and Rick Warren was wrong on something so fundamental as who is qualified to be a pastor and not, don't you think God at some point in that 40 years would have said, hey, Rick, hey, psst, Rick, you know, um, you, you got it wrong on just males being pastors. You got that wrong. Let me, let me clear up your understanding. You see, it, you, you start thinking about this logically, it doesn't work. Watch this from Priscilla Shire. 
Hi, I'm Priscilla Shire, and I'm hoping that you'll join me for a six-week journey as we talk about how we can hear and discern the voice of God in our lives. Do you really expect and anticipate that the divine voice of God can be heard by you? Do you really think that he loved you enough to die for you, but doesn't love you enough to then talk to you? Do you really think that he loved you enough to die for you, but then doesn't love you enough to talk to you? What does she think this is? I mean, honestly, what does she think this is? Now, watch this from Charles Stanley. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not calling Charles Stanley a false teacher. Uh, I differ with him on some significant issues. But uh, I, I show you this, I show you a clip from Charles Stanley because Charles Stanley, Southern Baptist, you know, he's not, he's not Benny Hinn, he's not Kenneth Copeland. I'm showing you a, a clip from a wide spectrum of prominent evangelicals to show you how ubiquitous and how almost unchallenged this doctrine is that God should be speaking to us on a regular basis outside of Scripture. Watch this from Charles Stanley. So you're, are you asking if God speaks specifically? And the answer is, yes, he does. Let me give you two or three examples. Speaking about buying groceries, on a particular day, I had a very short period of time, and so I wanted to buy a turkey for Thanksgiving. My time was really running out. I thought, well, I shouldn't do this now. I said, God, just show me what to do. It's like God said, go to this store, buy the turkey now. Against sort of my will, I went. I walked right in, straight to the right place, the right pound of turkey, walked right out, paid it, got back in the car in less than about 25 minutes. Did God tell me to go? Yes, he did. So... Charles Stanley has such a close relationship with God that God even tells him where to go get his Thanksgiving Day turkey. Has God ever told you where to go get your Thanksgiving Day turkey? Well, if God has never told you where to get your Thanksgiving Day turkey, then you must not have as close a relationship with God as does Charles Stanley. And Charles Stanley goes on to give another example of how he was buying a car one day on the, on the car lot, and he was about to ink the deal, and God said to him, do you want that car or do you want my best? And so then based upon God's words to him, he, said, he went and he got a more expensive car and that was, that was God's best. This is a book by a man named Sam Storms. Now Sam Storms would agree with us in that he has a high view of God's sovereignty and salvation. He believes in the doctrines of grace. But he is charismatic. He does believe that all of the sign gifts continue to be operative today. And Sam Storms writes this in his book entitled Practicing the Power. He says, quote, To be the recipient of prophetic revelation from God, whether in dreams, impressions, trances, visions, or words of knowledge and words of wisdom can be nothing short of euphoric. The experience brings feelings of nearness to God and a heightened sense of spiritual intimacy that isn't often the case with other of the charismata, so other of the spiritual gifts. So in other words, if you get dreams, if you get visions, trances, God speaks to you, maybe you even go to heaven every once in a while, then uh, that's real intimacy with God. You're, you're a spiritual have. But if you're one of these poor old souls, and let's just say you've got the gift of teaching, and You've got the Bible, gift of teaching. You know, that's, that's not so special, you see. Or if you have the gift of mercy, the gift of administration, you know, so that's, that's not so special. You're a have-not, sorry. You just don't have as close a walk with God as, as do the others. You, know, you get dreams and visions. They have a really intimate relationship with God. You know what that is? It's Gnosticism. It's a modern-day version of Gnosticism. The Gnostics divided people up into classes, the haves and the have-nots. So if you get dreams and visions, you're a, you're a have. But if you don't, sorry, tough luck, you're a have-not. It's a modern-day version of Gnosticism. It's what the charismatic movement is. Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. Anybody here ever done Experiencing God? Yeah. I have to um, taught it 
myself, actually. But I'm feeling much better now. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't teach it anymore. Um, Henry Blackaby. I would submit to you that Henry Blackaby and experiencing God, it, experiencing God is singularly most responsible for introducing charismatic theology into at least theoretically non-charismatic churches. Before experiencing God came out, every non-charismatic evangelical would have understood that God speaks to us in the Bible, we speak to Him in prayer. Every non-charismatic Christian would have understood that. Now, hardly anybody understands it. And I would submit to you that it was experiencing God that is singularly most responsible for muddying these waters that used to be pretty clear. Blackaby writes this. He says, if you have trouble hearing God speak, you're in trouble at the heart of your Christian experience. So again, the stakes are high. If you have trouble hearing God speak to you or have trouble knowing whether it is or is not God, you're in trouble at the very heart of of your Christian experience. What a burden. What a burden to place on people. But so many people claim that God speaks to them and speaks to them so clearly. Sean Bowles is one of these. Now you're, it's tempting to say Bowles, but his name actually is pronounced Bowles. But uh, Sean Bowles has his own ministry and a prophetic journey with Sean Bowles. He teaches you how to hear the voice of God because he's very good at it, you see. Sean Bowles, in fact, Sean Bowles hears God speak to him so clearly that God will even give him specific information about people that he's never met before, such as their addresses and even their usernames, you know, and their social media platforms. It's, it's amazing how Clearly, Sean Bolts hears God speaks, speak to him. And he's, uh, he's in big with Bill Johnson and uh, the NAR folks. Now, I'm going to show you a video clip, a couple of different clips of Sean Bolts, getting words of knowledge from God. God is going to speak to him, and you're going to see this in action. And uh, I want you to notice, as you watch these clips, notice uh, if you notice something. Look for something that might be kind of a clue as to exactly how God just might be speaking to uh, Mr. Bowles. I had one more username. I never get usernames, but I ask God for new information that I never get. Terry Bishop 911. Terry Bishop, you're working on the show and we're getting you. That is my uh, username, Terry Bishop 911. The Lord says, you live in a pleasant place. What does that mean to you? I live on Pleasant Hill. Come on. Sid Roth says that Sean Bowles is the most amazingly detailed prophet he has ever known. He has ministered to thousands, from royalty to people on the streets. Now he wants to share with you the secrets he has learned concerning the gift of prophecy prophecy and wants to activate you to do the same as he does. Call now and get Sean Bold's brand new book, Translating God, and his anointed three-part audio CD teaching, Everyone Can Hear God's Voice, exclusive for our It's Supernatural audience. Yours for a donation of $35. Did you notice, did you, did you pick up on the clue? He's standing there literally with his iPad or iPhone or whatever it was in his hand saying, Terry, Terry Bishop, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you live in a pleasant place. Uh, username. Uh... He's literally looking at a cell phone. What he's doing, he's looking up people's social media accounts and he's getting information off of their cotton picking social media and he's looking at his iPhone. I mean, in broad view. I mean, he's not even hiding it. And yet people fall for this. It's astonishing. Remember what I said, that false teachers are in and of themselves part of God's judgment. They're part of His judgment. A couple of years ago, he had this video posted on his YouTube channel. The three biggest blocks to hearing God's voice. The three biggest blocks to hearing God's voice. Well... I can tell you what the three biggest blocks to hearing God's voice uh, are for Sean Bolts. (laughs) 
He has a hard time hearing God uh, with a poor Wi-Fi connection. This is a book entitled The Power of a Whisper written by Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels, you might know that name. Bill Hybels was the pastor of Willow Creek Community Church. He was, he along with Rick Warren are two of the uh, leading proponents of the seeker-sensitive model approach to doing church, market-driven approach. And uh, Bill Hybels wrote this book and he talked about the importance of hearing God speak to you and the importance of hearing God speak to him and what that has meant in his life. And he says this, page 17, he says, without a hint of exaggeration, I can boldly declare that God's low volume whispers have saved me from a life of sure boredom and self-destruction. So God speaks to him in low volume whispers and they, these whispers saved him from a life of boredom and self-destruction. Well, God speaking in Jeremiah 23, is not my word like a fire declares the Lord and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Does that sound boring to you? Doesn't sound boring to me. And you might have noticed that I said that Bill Hybels was the pastor of Willow Creek Community Church. He no longer is. And the reason he's no longer the pastor of Willow Creek Community Church is because he disqualified himself morally from being the pastor. Sexual sin. So much for the power of those low volume whispers that saved him from self-destruction. Those low volume whispers apparently didn't quite do the trick. But you know what could have? This could have done it. If he had just obeyed what is written here, that could have saved him from a life of boredom and self-destruction. Have you heard this talk before? Prayer is a two-way street. Right? We talk to God in prayer and then it's a two-way street so we get real quiet and we listen real hard for Him to talk back to us. Prayer is a two-way street. This is what we've been taught. Watch this from Robert Morris. You know, if we said we're going to have a class on prayer, you'd say, that's, that's, I need that. And even the disciples said, teach us to pray. But let me remind you that hearing God is the second half of prayer. Because if you can't hear God, why would you pray? Now, one reason is to make our requests and petitions be known to God. But God never intended prayer to be a giving of our to-do list to Him every morning. He intended prayer to be communication between a father and his children. And if you'll just take some time and start to listen, you'll be amazed that he'll speak. So, prayer is a two-way street. I mean, I could give you thousands of examples of this kind of teaching. Almost everyone believes it. And so we hear this, and we've got something going on in our lives, and we're not real sure what to do, what decision to make. And so we're very sincere about it. And I'm not mocking here because years ago, many years ago, I used to do this before I knew any better, but uh, I would go to the Lord and pray to the Lord, Lord, this is what's going on in my life. This is the decision I have to make. Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, please speak to me. You know, I'm listening and I get real quiet and listen real hard. And then inevitably when we do this, what happens? A thought, right? Just kind of, you know, we hear... We hear some words and we think, oh, oh, was that you, Lord, or was that me? You know, was that God or was that the pizza I ate tonight? I mean, how do you know? How do you know when it's God speaking to you? Well, prayer is a two-way street, so it, it, it must be true. The problem, though, is that it's not true. Dear friends, you won't find anything like that modeled in Scripture. Nowhere, Old or New Testament, you will search the Bible in vain for anything suggesting that prayer is a two-way street. 
In fact, if prayer was a two-way street, then the perfect place for Jesus to tell us would be in Luke chapter 11. Because in Luke chapter 11, the disciples asked Jesus very directly, Lord, teach us to pray. All right. The scene is set, right? I mean, the ball is sitting on prayer is a two-way street tee, just waiting for Jesus to knock it out of the park. Guys, it's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. So here's how you pray. You talk to God and you get real quiet and you listen real hard. Put on your listening ears and you listen for him to talk back to you. Is that what he said? No, he said nothing of the sort. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing about prayer being a two-way street. Perfect place for Jesus to tell us, but he said nothing of the sort. There's nothing in the Bible at all, anywhere, to indicate to us that prayer is a two-way street. It's just not there. Well, what about the still, small voice? I mean, God speaks to us in a still, small voice, right? Beth Moore thinks so. She tweeted, there's a time to give up and a time to keep trying. Sometimes the time to keep trying feels a whole lot like the time to give up. The only difference is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit within you saying, try again. And again, this is just one of thousands of examples I could give to you. So a still small voice. I mean, that's in the Bible, right? I mean, it's in the Bible. So God does speak to us in a still small voice, right? Well, it is in the Bible, but it's, there, it's only in one place in the Bible, and it's only in one translation, the King James. If you don't have the King James translation, you will not find that phraseology, still small voice. You've got to have the King James. But it is in there, so let's look at it. 1 Kings chapter 19. Now for context, this is Elijah, and Elijah had just had that dramatic victory over the false prophets of, of Baal. Remember, he called down fire from heaven, destroyed the false prophets, destroyed their altars, destroyed their sacrifices, lapped up all the water. I mean, dramatic victory. And then right after that, Jezebel threatened Elijah's life, and he got scared, an odd thing, after that big victory. And then Jezebel got after him. And so he got out of Dodge. He fled into the wilderness and ended up in the back of a cave. And this is where the story picks up in 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. Now, the language here is King James English, okay? And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. There it is. The only place in the entire Bible that you'll find it, and it's got to be in the King James. So, what was this still, small voice? Well, the next verse tells us. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in, the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? So you see, dear friends, the still small voice was not some inner impression inside his head, like everybody thinks. Oh, God speaks to you in a still small voice. This little still small voice inside your head. No. It wasn't a still small voice inside Elijah's head. It was not internal. It was external. It was not subjective. It was audible. The text says he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out. After he heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out to the entrance of the cave so he could hear this voice more clearly, which was outside of the cave, not inside his head. It was an external, audible voice, just like you are hearing my voice right now to you externally, audibly. So can we please do away with the whole still small voice thing? 
This has been completely taken out of context and turned into something that it never was in the first place. And I'll take it a step further. What we read here in 1 Kings 19 is descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, there are a, one of the fundamental hermeneutical problems of the charismatic movement is they interpret practically the entire Bible as prescriptive when a lot of it is descriptive. In other words, they take things that are described and they automatically think that they are also prescribed for us. There's a ton of things in the Bible that are described that are not prescribed. God parting the Red Sea is described but it's not prescribed. Have you ever seen God split a body of water? I haven't either. Talking donkeys are described, but they're not prescribed. Have you ever seen a talking donkey? I hope not. If you have, you should probably lay off the suds a little bit because you've been drinking something too enthusiastically that you shouldn't be drinking. So there's a lot of things that are floating axe heads are described. They're not prescribed. Okay, that's one of the fundamental problems. This is described. It's not, a, it's not prescribed. But charismatic, and most people today even get the description wrong. It's not internal. It's external. It's external, audible voice. So please, let's do away with the still small voice thing. Well... Since I burst that bubble, let's, uh, let's, let's burst another one. How about John 10, 27? My sheep hear my voice. I mean, that's in the Bible. You can't argue with that, right? All right. So John chapter 10, look at verse 1. We're talking about we're sheep and we can hear God. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief, and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, now watch this carefully, and the sheep, watch, hear his voice. Can, can you just say those three words? Hear his voice. It's so John 10, 27 to me is the most concise and comprehensive verse in scripture about hearing God. Uh, it is when Jesus says, my sheep, yeah. Hear my voice, mm -hmm. I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Bada boom, bada bing, you can't argue with that. There it is right there in black and white. Well, problem is, is, you know the Princess Bride movie, you know, you keep using that word. instead of It's like you keep using that verse. I do not think it means what you think it means. Let's look at this verse in its context because the context determines the meaning. And all we need to do is go up just one verse, verse 26, for the context. Jesus is speaking, but you, who is you? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, you do not believe. Why do you not believe? You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 26 tells us immediately what the context is. This is belief. This is salvation. Look at the next verse, verse 28. And I give eternal life to them. To whom? To the sheep. I give eternal life to them. Dear friends, this is not talking about God whispering to you, telling you where to go to have lunch one day or to tell you to take a right turn at this intersection instead of a left turn like you normally do. No, this is, this is salvation. This is regeneration. This is the new birth. This is the effectual call of the gospel. Christian, what were you before you became a Christian? Were you a sheep or were you a goat? Goat, sheep, you were a sheep, you were a sheep. You were just a lost sheep. You see, when a person gets saved, that's not a goat turning into a sheep. 
Goats don't turn into sheep. Sheep don't turn into goats. Before our conversion as Christians, we were still sheep. We were just lost sheep. Lost sheep out there in the pasture of life with our heads down, grazing, minding our own business. But then one day we hear a voice. We hear someone call us and we perk our heads up and we see the shepherd and we go to him. This is a picture of the new birth. This is a picture of salvation. This is a picture of regeneration. This is the effectual call of the gospel. And Jesus says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is a beautiful picture. And look at verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. Christian, do you know what you are? You and I are gifts given by the Father to the Son. When were we given by the Father to the Son? When, when did this happen? from before the foundation of the earth, in eternity past. We are love gifts from the Father to the Son. That's why we've always been sheep. We just were lost sheep until we heard the voice of the shepherd. And we went to him. And he holds us in his hand. He says, no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And look at what he says now. And then he says, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So we, as, as his sheep, we are being, we were summoned, we were called, we were summoned to come to the shepherd and we come to him and we walk into his hand and he holds us. And then as if his hand were not strong enough, and it is, but then, verse 29, he takes the Father's hand and wraps it, as it were, around that of his own. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. We are being held in the hand of Christ, whose hand is being held by the hand of the Father. And dear friends, ain't nobody getting out of that. If you've ever wondered about eternal security, if you've ever wondered about whether or not you can lose your salvation, spend some time in John chapter 10. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. And it's full of comfort for us as believers. And I'm going to say something that may sound harsh, but I mean this. If you're listening to a preacher or you're reading some book written by some big name evangelical and they talk about John 10, 27 and that's what they get out of it, God whispering to you inside your head in some still small voice, if that's what their takeaway is of John 10, 27, that person has no business teaching the Word of God. None. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to know what John chapter 10 is talking about. I mean, it's quite clear just by reading it in English. If someone can reduce John 10, 27, a passage that is that clear and that beautiful and that majestic and reduce it down to something so trivial and meaningless, is God whispering you to tell you where to go to have lunch one day? That person has no business being, being a teacher of God's Word. You drop that person like a hot potato. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jesus Calling. This is the hottest selling devotional book on the market. Nothing else is even close. This is light years ahead of everything else out there. Jesus Calling. And there's all kinds of um, spinoffs now. Anytime something kind of breaks out in the Christian publishing world and sells a bunch of copies, there's always spinoffs. You know, and now there's spinoffs. This is the original Jesus Calling. There's all these spinoffs. There's Jesus Calling Teenagers, Jesus Calling Mothers, Jesus Calling Firemen, Jesus, you know, I'm just waiting for Jesus Calling Little White Cripple Boys to come out so I can, 
so I can see what Jesus is wanting to tell me. Um, light years ahead of everything else. I want to show you some excerpts directly out of the introduction to Jesus Calling, copied and pasted, no edits on my part at all. Sarah Young writes this, During the same year, 92, I began reading God Calling, a devotional book by two anonymous listeners. These women practiced waiting quietly in God's presence, pencils and papers in hand, recording the messages they received from Him. So God Calling is a book, I have a copy of it, that was written back in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago. And it was written by two anonymous female mystics. We don't even know these ladies' names. Uh, probably Roman Catholic mystics. But uh, these ladies wanted to learn how to hear the voice of God. And so they practiced hearing the voice of God. And it's like the more they practiced, they finally tuned in to just the right frequency. And when they hit just the right frequency, Jesus, or God, started calling them. And that was their inspiration for writing God Calling. And they began to write down what he said, pencils and papers in hand, recording the messages they received from it. This was the inspiration for Sarah Young to write Jesus Calling. Sarah Young, she did the same thing. She practiced waiting in the presence of God, and she finally tuned in to just the right frequency. And when she hit just the right frequency, Jesus began calling her Jesus Calling. Sarah Young says, I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for more. You see, the Bible just wasn't enough for Sarah Young. It's not that Sarah Young denies that the Bible is the Word of God. She's just, she said it, it wasn't enough. She yearned for more. And tragically, the same can be said of the vast majority of evangelicals today. Uh, it's not that they outright deny the Bible is the Word of God, but they, it's just not enough. They've got to have something more than the Bible. Here's my question to anyone who would say they need something more. Have you completely mastered this book? From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, you have mastered it start to finish, cover to cover. You have squeezed every drop of truth there is to be squeezed from these pages. Nothing else you can learn, you have mastered it all. If the answer to that question is no, and it is, because, dear friends, none of us has mastered this book. None of us has. All of us, we could spend a thousand lifetimes studying this book, combine all of our knowledge, and still just scratch the surface of what's in here. So if the answer to that question is no, please don't tell me that the Bible's not enough. You don't even know what you have in black and white right in front of you. But it wasn't enough for Sarah Young. She said, I decided to listen to God with pen in hand, writing down whatever I believed he was saying. Houston, we have a problem. Just like the ladies who wrote God Calling, Sarah Young tuned in to just the right frequency. Jesus began to call her, and with pen in hand, she began to write down what he was saying. If that is what is happening, if Jesus is calling Sarah Young and she's writing down what he's saying, you know what she's doing? She's writing scripture. That's what she's doing. She's writing scripture. And let's think about this logically, take it to its logical conclusion. The same thing must be said when any anytime someone says, God spoke to me and said, quote, da 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 da. Because whatever God says to you, whatever God says is authoritative. Why? Because God said it. And it has just as much authority as any verse in the Bible. God cannot speak in the Bible and really, really, really mean it. But when He speaks to us today outside of the Bible, He, he still means it, but He doesn't mean it quite as much as He meant it here. How does that work? I mean, He just sort of means it? Kind of means it? I mean, when He, when he speaks to us today outside of the Bible, He just... Maybe he has his fingers crossed. I mean, how does God cannot speak less authoritatively on one occasion than he does on another? If God is speaking, God is speaking. What makes this book authoritative? Is it that it's got a, you know, a, a leather or whatever this is, not leather, but whatever this is, cover, you know, and it's got some nice little golding 
golden uh, gilding on the edges of the pages and these neat little ribbons down here. Is that what makes it authoritative? No, it makes it authoritative. What makes it authoritative is that it is theonoustos, that it is God-breathed. These are the words of God. That's what makes it authoritative. And so when people say God spoke to me, whatever He is saying to you should carry every bit as much authority as any verse in this book. So whatever God is saying to all these people, then we need to add what He is saying to this book. There's just one problem with that. This book says do not add to this book. This also from Beth Moore in her book, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things, she writes this, I am being as honest as I know how to be when I say that I did not write these pages by simple preference. I wrote them because had I not, the rocks in my yard would have cried out. Nothing like applying that verse to yourself. What God does with what He has promised is His business. I entrust this message entirely to the one who delivered it while I sat bug-eyed. So Beth Moore was just this passive recipient and God started to download information to her and she was just sitting there bug-eyed as God downloaded this information to her that came out in this book, When Godly People Do Ungodly Things. So if that's true, if that's what happened, if that's how this book came into being, you know what? Then that book by Beth Moore, that's canon. Oh, I mean, that should be canonized. That's scripture right there. I can tell you one thing that God, godly people don't do. Godly people don't claim that God is speaking to them when He's not. Watch this from Matt Chandler. So, so let's talk about what prophecy is and what prophecy isn't. Um, the thus saith the Lord, look right at me, is over. Look at me. When this text is talking about prophecy, it's not talking about the way Jeremiah prophesied or Isaiah prophesied. Or, you know, that, that's closed. That's canonized. So you will never prophesy in a way that's on par, equal to, anywhere near the inerrant, infallible Word of God. That's closed, shut. And so the best you've got, the best you've got is the humility to say, I think the Lord would have me lay this before you. So two things. Matt Chandler says, you know, when you prophesy, that's not, it's not on the level of this, this prophecy. It's, it's not like Isaiah. It's not like Jeremiah. You know, that's closed. It's canonized. No, we just talked about that. God cannot speak less authoritatively on one occasion than He does on another. So that's a, a, a false argument that He gives. But then he says, he says, the best we've got, the best we've got is to say, I think the Lord would have me lay this before you. I think the Lord would have me to tell you. You know, I just really feel like the Lord is trying to tell us, said nobody in the Bible ever. Said nobody in the Bible ever. I really feel like He's trying, no. Dear friends, once again, you will search the Bible in vain for any, anything even remotely approaching that. When God spoke, He spoke with crystal clear clarity. I feel like the Lord said to me. Well, what does the Bible say? The word of the Lord came to Abram. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. In the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit spoke, He spoke with crystal clear clarity. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Crystal clear clarity. Nobody in the Bible ever said anything like, I feel like the Lord is trying to tell. No, the Lord doesn't try to do anything. He just does. If you have to wonder whether or not God spoke to you, He didn't. Okay? If you have to wonder whether or not God spoke to you, He didn't. So how does God speak to us today? Well, let's go to the text. Hebrews chapter 1. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in His Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. The writer of Hebrews says that in the old days, in the Old Testament, God spoke to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. God spoke in many different ways indeed. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He spoke to Moses on the mountain through storm and thunder. He spoke to Elijah through that still small voice. Uh, Numbers chapter 22, God even made a donkey talk. So God did indeed speak in many different portions and in many different ways. But in these last days, says the writer of Hebrews, He has spoken to us in His Son. Friends, Jesus is the final speaking of God. The final speaking of God. Everything that God has to say to us, He has said in His Son, Jesus Christ. And we have a perfect inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient record of that in His Word. Jesus is the final speaking of God. Well, if you're saying that God only speaks to us in in the Bible, well, well, how do I know God's will for my life? You know, God doesn't tell me where to go to college or if I should go to college. God doesn't tell me the Bible doesn't tell me if I should be a dentist or a plumber or, or an accountant. The Bible doesn't tell me where, which state I should live in. You know, the Bible doesn't tell me what, you know, who to marry other than marry a believer. But, uh, so how do I know God's will for my life? Well, here's how you know God's will for your life. If you have some big decision that you need to make and you're not sure what to do, here's how you know God's will for your life. Read, study, and obey His Word. Read, study, and obey His Word. If you're not doing that, then nothing else matters anyway. But if you've got some big decision to make and you're not sure what the decision should be, then pray for wisdom. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it liberally in abundance. Now, if you're not doing step number one, if you're not reading, studying, and obeying God's Word, don't bother asking God for wisdom. He's not going to give it to you. But if you are, pray for wisdom. And then, seek wise, godly counsel. The book of Proverbs says, there is wisdom, there is safety in a multitude of counselors. And I have some men in my life that I do that with. So if something comes up in my life or my ministry and I'm not sure what to do, what the right decision to, you know, to make is, then I'm going to seek some wise, godly counsel. The first person from whom I will seek wise, godly counsel is named Kathy. She's my wife. And we will talk about it. And if after the two of us talk about it, we both decide, you know, we should probably get some other eyes on this. I've got some men in my life that I'll go to and I'll say, brothers, this is what I'm facing. This is the decision I need to make. What is your counsel? And you know what? That has served me well in doing that. That's served me well. There's wisdom in doing that. So read, study, and obey God's word. Pray for wisdom. Seek wise, godly counsel. And then Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He might direct your paths. He'll direct your paths if He's got nothing better to do. He will direct your paths. How does God do that? I don't have the slightest idea. I just know He does. Friends, He spoke the universe into existence. I think He can direct our paths. It's interesting that even in the New Testament, even in the New Testament, in the apostolic age, you don't see the apostles going around praying things like this, Lord, show me your specific individual will for my life. You don't see them doing that. What do you see them doing? Well, you really just see them doing stuff. They just did stuff. Paul said in Titus chapter 3, He said, I have decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis. Why did Paul spend the winter at Nicopolis? Because he decided to spend the winter at Nicopolis, so he spent the winter at Nicopolis. That's why he did it. Paul stayed in Athens by himself, and he sent Timothy ahead because we thought it best. 
That's why we did it. We thought it best to do so, and so we did it. They just did stuff. Now, on occasion, you will see the Holy Spirit redirecting them, but even that's rare. They just, they just did stuff. So, dear friends, just do stuff. Read, study, and obey His Word. Pray for wisdom. Seek godly counsel. Look at the opportunities before you and make a wise decision and just do stuff. You know, if you want to be a plumber, be a plumber. If you want to be a dentist, be a dentist. If you want to live in this state and not this state, then go to that state and not the other. You know, just do stuff. And God will direct your paths. Again, He spoke the universe into existence. I think He can direct our paths. If you'd like to do a deeper dive on this issue, I would highly commend to you this book, God Doesn't Whisper by Jim Osmond. You can get it at his website, jimosmond.com. Jim is a friend of mine. Uh, he's a pastor in Sandpoint, Idaho. He's one of the best preachers I've heard. He's a really, really good guy. And he's written several books. Uh, this is one of four that he's written. But uh, this does a deep dive and leaves no stone unturned on the whole, how does God speak to us today? Really, really good book. So I commend that to you. And I will conclude our session. Oh, by the way, let me, let me bring up this point. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that if hearing God speak to us is such a vitally important part of our lives as Christian, Christians, why is it that the New Testament does not give us one syllable of instruction on how to do it? You ever thought about that? What do we have in the Gospels? Well, we've got the account of the life and ministry of Jesus. His ministry, crucifixion, resurrection. What do we have in the book of Acts? Well, we've got the birth of the church and the spread of the gospel. What do we have in the pastoral epistles? Uh, Paul's letters to the different churches, church in Ephesus, church uh, in Corinth. We've got all these pastoral epistles, instructions on how to do church, you know, instructions on qualifications of elders, instructions on how to resolve conflict amongst believers. We've got instructions of church discipline. We've got uh, instructions on, uh, we've got theology and doctrine and, you know, Romans and Ephesians all loaded with doctrine and theology and all of these instructions on all these great many things. We've got eschatology in the book of Revelation, you know, and eschatology is sprinkled throughout. So we've got all these instructions on all these great many and varied things. And yet, on this, this thing that is supposed to be so important in our lives as believers, and if you don't hear God speak to you, you're in trouble at the heart of your Christian experience on something that important. There is not one syllable of instruction on how to hear the voice of God. You ever thought about that? If this is so important, then why did God not, get, not give us any instruction on how to do it? For two reasons. One, if God is still speaking outside of Scripture... You wouldn't have any trouble knowing it was God and exactly what He said. But the other reason, and the one that overshadows that, is God is not speaking to us today outside of the Bible. That is how He has spoken to us, in His Word. I'm going to end with a rather extended quote from Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon writes this, he says, Honor the Spirit of God as you would honor Jesus Christ if He were present. If Jesus Christ were dwelling in your house, you would not ignore Him. You would not go about your business as if He were not there. Do not ignore the presence of the Holy Spirit in your soul. To Him, pay your constant adorations. Reverence the august guest who has been pleased to make your body His sacred abode. Love Him, obey Him, worship Him. Take care never to impute the vain imaginings of your fancy to Him. I have seen the Spirit of God shamefully dishonored by persons, I hope they were insane, who have said that they have had this or that revealed to them. There has not for some years passed over my head a single week in which I have not been pestered with the revelations of hypocrites or maniacs. Semi-lunatics are very fond of coming with messages from the Lord to me, and it may save them some trouble if I tell them once and for all that I will have none of your stupid messages." 
Never dream that events are revealed to you by heaven, or you may come to be like those idiots who dare impute their blatant follies to the Holy Spirit. If you feel your tongue to itch to talk nonsense, trace it to the devil, not to the Spirit of God. Whatever is to be revealed by the Spirit to any of us is in the Word of God already. He adds nothing to the Bible and never will. Let persons who have revelations of this or that and the other go to bed and wake up in their senses. I only wish they would follow the advice and no longer insult the Holy Spirit by laying their nonsense at His door. Indeed. Dear friends, if you want to hear God speak to you, there's one way I guarantee you, you will hear God speak. Read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak to you audibly, read it out loud. 100% guaranteed you will hear Him speak. God's Word is sufficient. It's not only inerrant, it is sufficient for us. Everything that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is in His Word. All right. Thank you very much, dear ones. Hope this has been helpful for you. Pastor Jim.